I have to say thank you to uh, Richard Pilbro. I have to say thank you to Richard Pilbro nearly every day for my life because he's been such a generous mentor and one of the few people who had ever written anything about projection when I was scratching my way to figuring out what it was all about in the uh, mid-70s. So thank you, Richard, for that. And I, and I suppose I should address the elephant that's not in the room, and that is I'm pitch-hitting here today. Uh, I was uh, not the original guest speaker, the original keynote speaker, I don't know who it was, um, is not here because of some kind of uh, problem. Uh, and that's becoming, uh, we're becoming more and more aware of. I don't know what the problem was, I don't know who it is. They called me up and said, could you, you know, come in two weeks and, you know, write something. And so, so, I, so here I am, so thank you for coming to my anonymous talk. So, uh, <laughs> I'm here as the stealth presenter. Um, so I had to look up, what's a keynote? Uh, <laughs> You know, I just say yes. I'd like, I have a really bad habit of saying yes. Uh, and then it's like, oh yeah, okay, I think I can figure this out. You know, I figured out over time, and you will figure this out of time, most everything is not rocket science. And if you just apply yourself, you can generally figure it out. And I've met some rocket scientists, and they tell me that's pretty much the way it is for them, too. <laughs> so, um, so at conventions and ex expositions and academic conferences, a keynote address is delivered to set the underlying tone and summarize the core message or the most important revelation uh, of the event. I'm afraid to be too revelatory. Um, and then I read the USITT mission statement. Um, Somebody is doing slides for me, so I'm like, uh, uh, okay, so USITT connects performing arts, design, technology, and technology communities to ensure a vibrant dialogue among practitioners, educa educators, and students. Vibrant dialogue, that I can do. <laughs> so, so to be aware and alive right now is to, make, is to be engaged in equity, diversity, inclusion initiatives, time's up, me too, never again, Black Lives Matter, and, and questions of cultural appropriation. It's a whirlwind of what we hope will become change. In a whirlwind, it's hard to know, up from down. And academics are finding their formerly quiet worlds upturned, and even the most well-meaning people are on the defensive. You're either a person who's experienced abuse, sexual, physical, verbal, or the sting of gender or racial discrimination, or you know a person or a coworker has felt this, or been accused of abuse or discrimination, or you are just very curious about the details, salient, purient, or otherwise. You can't be ignorant of what's going on. It's everywhere. And while facts and even definitions are fluid, outrage and fear are omnipresent. It's the air we breathe. It's, there's no escape. For a long time, longtime colleagues of ours are retiring, some in shame, some in fear, and the rest of us are searching for the correct response, the right language. Wait, what? The right language? This is what we do. We're the theater makers. We make the language. We make worlds where painful discussions are had eight times a week. Engagement, catharsis, it's what we do, it's who we are. So the language ought to come from us. So how did we get to be standing in this public puddle of pain and confusion? You can say it's endemic, it's everywhere. Theater people are just more public, we act out. Our laundry is more visible. It's more fun to knock down people who are admired and so on. To call out, cast out, to punish the reprehensible, of course, is important. But what matters now is how do we move forward? You, if, you all likely think of me, if you think of me at all, as the godmother of projectors, which is really a tag I'd like to get rid of. Uh, <laughs> projectors? Uh, I wrote him a note, John Simon, at the, moment, at the time, and said, Projections, darling. Uh, <laughs> but he still seemed to like the work that I did, though he does seem to hate everybody else, so it's a kind of uncomfortable place to be. Um, <laughs> so, you, so you think of me as a designer, as a teacher, all of which is true, and certainly the reason why I was invited to come here today. But I'm also a woman, a parent, and a product of the 60s, which means if it needs to be done, it must be my job to do it. In a co... <laughs> In 
in October 2016, I was invited to the White House to attend a festival of ideas, art, and action. Maybe the best day of my life so far. There were scientists, engineers, artists, and social justice workers all brought together to bring what wisdom and skills we had to the problems of racism, income inequality, global warming, world hunger, misogyny. I felt shot out of a cannon that day. Energized, positive, with a clear sense that not only could I work to move the world forward, I had to. 30 days later, my world had changed. How to continue the mission when the team had been disbanded? Like many, I became depressed. But I kept remembering these words I heard from President Obama. Everyone can be kind, everyone can be useful. Okay, I'm a designer, a storyteller. I've been able to make people think things. So for the past year, I've been searching for a word or an image that might become the equivalent to the 60s peace symbol. Peace symbol, picture, which was original, slide, somebody, okay. <laughs> Just in case you don't remember, some of you weren't born then. Um, uh, which was originally designed for the 50s disarmament uh, movement, uh, or the AIDS crisis, silence equals death. Another slide, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I wanted an unequivocal idea, a thing you can't argue with, a permeating visual. And the late genius Tibor Kalman came very close with them equals us. Another slide, okay, thanks. It could be my, you know, it was only me. Uh, it could be my fault, I'll totally take the responsibility, I am female. Um, <laughs> so I love them equals us, but it does, you, know, you can hear a little bit of an argument with that, so I, I, I'm, I'm still searching. So as I'm in the middle of this, and I'm really in the middle of this, I'm talking about this everywhere I go, and, uh, I get a call from Chris Rock, the comedian, who I actually work for uh, on a number of occasions. I've done a number of comedy tours with him. And he called me and he said he wanted to find a word to put on his LED wall behind him, something that would have value, speak of the time, and something not funny. This is like a gift from the goddess. I spent the next few weeks on the phone with Chris Rock and emails back and forth playing words with friends. This is, this is a good gig. Uh, so first we start with resist, nah. Woke, no. Justice, Chris said, a black man standing in front of this is looking for trouble. <laughs> I had to admit, he wasn't wrong. So then as I joked at the time, just like a man to win by changing the rules, he suggested comfort is the poison. That's a phrase, not a word, but okay. It's not everything I was hoping for, but he'd settled. It was a truth, and after discussing a poison versus the poison, and if comfort is poison, and about 15 typeface options later, it went out on tour. But I'm still searching for the word, and just now I'm playing with this one, empathy. Chris rejected it as, not being, as being a word people don't use that much. Uh, empathy is the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within their frame of reference, or a capacity to place oneself in another's position. I happen to think Chris Rock is empathic. His success as a writer and a filmmaker is evidence of his ability to read back his understanding of how people feel, only now it's funny. Still, the word does not have as much currency as it ought. Perhaps it's our suspicion of an interior TH. I mean, who does that? Um, it's taken from the German Einfallung, I've been practicing, um, or feeling into, and it's only been in use in the English language for about 100 years. But the idea has been around for a lot longer, even in America. The in the theory of moral sentiments, which was from 1759, Adam Smith observed Though our brother is upon the rack, as long as we are, th the rack was a torture device, not the thing that's got the gear in it, just for the, <laughs> just for the, you know, it suddenly dawned on me, my audience might be having like a different picture of the rack. But to be upon the rack was to be, was not good. As, as opposed to what you might feel otherwise. Um, 
So though our brother, this is 1759, uh, though our brother is upon the rack, as long as we ourselves are at our ease, our senses will never inform us what he suffers. Smith states that what makes us moral beings was the imaginative capacity to place ourselves in his situation. There is no theater without imaginative capacity. Whether on stage or in the audience, we are absorbed in the act of putting ourselves in another's shoes. As designers, we get inside the characters and the story so that we can correctly provide the places they inhabit or to design the clothes that look as though they would have chosen them themselves. This is an act of empathy. It turns out that we gain something at a neural level by engaging with theater. In a 2012 study, researchers Thalia Goldstein and Ellen Winner assessed empathy levels in elementary and high school students who had received one year of either acting or other arts training. They found that those who had studied acting for the year and not another type of art showed the most significant growth in empathy scores, which is why we are not surprised that the young leaders of the Never Again movement are the theater kids. Apparently, when we watch another person engage in a type of emotional or physical behavior, something called mirror neuron system is in action. When an emotion is physically expressed, a viewer's instinct is to respond in kind, which was why we may feel the instinct to smile when we see someone laughing, or cringe when we see someone else in pain. In live theater, we are not just watching and listening from afar, we are breathing the same air as the characters. Researchers from the University of Arkansas Department of Education Reform found students who attended a live showing of either Hamlet or A Christmas Carol scored higher on the study's measure for tolerance than a control group. I've been saying this for years. Theater proves the potential for world peace. Strangers in a room laugh, cry, feel as one, no matter what their background, so there has to be hope for us to agree on something. And yet discrimination and abuse happens in our world where we're practicing neural mirroring on a daily basis. I have this quote over my desk from the philosopher Simone Weil. Love for our neighbor being made of creative attention is analogous to genius. To forget oneself briefly to the point of fully recognizing him or her is to defy necessity. Creative attention, that seems attractive. Could be a good definition for what we as designers do when we're considering a script or a problem. To forget oneself to is to defy necessity, that's the hard part. We have to defy the idea that we are different, special, more important. But the rewards of that can be great. That self-forgetting that's the exhilaration we feel, transported right out of our seats and ourselves when we become the thwarted lover, the happy bride, the plotting murderer. We are unselfed in those moments. We are freed to become the other human across the footlights, who in their craft challenges us to succumb to this displacement. Unselfing helps me be the leaping ballerina in defiance of my own gravity. I become Aida, mourning the loss of country. That becomes my country. I get to be Alexander Hamilton, not throwing away my shot. Theater is what we live for. We theater folks, we live for these moments of transport, the connection. It's the embrace that makes us feel more alive. It's us plus. Just as we live for the collaborations that build a handful of notions into an idea we know we are made better by letting go of ownership. That's more us plus. And yet seeing yourself as the center of the universe is very hard to let go of. You all know this, every single thing I've said. Maybe not the Adam Smith quote, or the German word I'll never remember. <laughs> but you know the shape of these ideas very well. My job today is to remind you and to provoke the vibrant dialogue. I'd like to remind you of one more thing. Keep it real. Theater technology is in service to the larger ideal of live storytelling. 
Look what I can do is entertainment, not theater. Nothing wrong with entertainment. I love an e-ticket ride. It just doesn't move me. I come to the theater to be changed. That is my fervent hope each and every time. Theater technology has enormous power and possibility, but it's my job to remind you the measure of theatrical space is the human body. And as Robert Edmund Jones said, I've come to see the play, not the work done on the play. An algorithm should not be making artistic decisions. It will never lift me from my seat. Artificial intelligence is wicked cool, but it lacks human warps, warmth. And raising performers from the dead, I would say, is morally ambiguous. <laughs> try every, well, where's their paycheck? Uh, try, <laughs> I don't know, if I was Tupac, I'd be looking for my money. Um, <laughs> try everything, of course. Does, you know, the union have a thing for, like, post-death? You know? um, <laughs> The rules have not been written. Uh, try everything, of course. Uh, but please remember the real power tools that are on stage. They have a temperature reading of about 98.6. As a projection designer, this is a matter of particular concern to me. Everything I do or will do is a lie. Nothing I put on stage is actually there. It's not really raining. The forest did not just come closer. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. He's a live feed or maybe he's not in the theater. I make pictures of a thing that's actually absent. It's symbolic of the absent. I ask the audience to read a reality from those pictures. I ask them to see depth from projections that are flat. I ask them to participate in the illusion. Both sides of this equation must be generous. The audience must lend time, intelligence, and problem solving. And I need to show respect for that time, intelligence, and problem solving. Thoughtful, fluid, and musical movement of images is the dance I do with time. Images that are neither banal, obvious, nor confounding respect the viewer's knowledge and aspiration. Surprise and nested imagery rewards problem solving with the delight of discovery. Designers have many masters, and it can feel exhausting, the author, the director, to say nothing of the producer. Um, but our fundamental relationship is with the audience. It requires, as all successful relationships do, a certain amount of sacrifice, hard work, and a great deal of listening. I encourage you to fine tune your ears to the most abstract music, the sound of an audience feeling. Listen to the movement in the seats, the coughs, the silence, the laughter, the sighs. Of course, this is very hard to do. You're waiting and anxious to see how your cue looks. You're making a list of what you have to accomplish before you might get to sleep. Maybe you've seen or heard the work a dozen times and you're over it. But try, listen, feel what they are feeling. Try and see it for the first time. They don't know what you know. They weren't at the meeting when that decision was made. Try and hear the feeling, and I promise you will be educated. You'll know exactly when they lost the thread, or heaven forbid, applauded the effect that took them right out of the play. You can hear the silence of attention and communion. With time, persistence, and some unselfing, you will become a better theater artist. I want my work to be penetrating and yet nearly unseen, as if an image could have something like scent or be as moving as music can be. It's a crazy conundrum, this desire to feel vision. I read this quote from Robert Edmund Jones, whose dramatic imagination is still one of the best works on theater design as far as I'm concerned. Stage designing should be addressed to the eye of the mind. There is an outer eye that observes, and an inner eye that sees. So how to get in touch with this inner eye? I'm thinking it's empathy and reaching beyond your own prejudices. We dismiss the audience at our own peril. They won't understand, goes by so quickly no one will notice, the 11 o'clock number goes here, it's better if they know the song's on the way in. That's dismissive. We are not gods raining down our gifts. They are our teachers, as well as our patrons. 
So practice listening. There is a great deal at stake these days, professionally, personally, and nationally, and our teachers can come from anywhere. I don't have the hubris to think I can solve this, but I can make this statement with certainty. Empathy has no downside. From what I've read, empathy. Uh, <laughs> there's a slide here. Um, I thank whoever is doing this, God bless you, because I don't have the computer in front of me. Um, empathy has no downside, and from what I've read, we theater makers are promoting empathy even without knowing. So it makes sense to me that taking what we already love into the rest of our lives can only have an upside. So here's my last slide, there it is. So thank you. Have a, and, <laughs>